Hey Gadget Groupies, years ago I produced a camera showdown between smartphone cameras and interchangeable lens DSLRs. It was a really casual comparison between the two systems, definitely flawed as any kind of scientific test uh, because of the lens that I had picked for my Canon 7D at the time, but I really wanted it to be a platform to illustrate the strengths and the differences between proper cameras and the phones at the time. We were seeing a whole bunch of clickbait articles and clickbaity videos uh, intended to really impress people about the new crop of smartphone cameras. Enough time has passed since I originally produced that first comparison that I think it's worth revisiting what our phones can do versus the current generation of proper cameras. The main purpose of this video to compare the output of a proper interchangeable lens system you can tailor in exactly the optics that you want or you need against an all-rounder consumer gadget. The smartphone. The Mate 10 Pro is the right choice for this comparison. Not necessarily for it having better blur algorithms. Actually, the champion there would probably still be the Pixel 2, which is funny because it only has a single camera lens, but more for the fact that the Mate 10 Pro maintains the full field of view of its cameras while doing this wide aperture portrait mode manipulation. We're not using a zoom sensor, we're not cropping in the field of view in any way, so we maintain the full equivalent 27 millimeter field field of view from this phone. Against my G85 paired with a 15 millimeter lens, that's gonna be close to a 30 millimeter field of view if we're talking about 35 millimeter equivalencies. We should be able to see pretty easily what a phone can do against an interchangeable lens system and not have to worry too much about significant differences in focal length. Now, some things never change. Even though Micro Four Thirds uses a slightly smaller sensor than my previous APS-C cameras, definitely smaller than a full frame sensor, which you might find on a current generation Sony camera, it's still significantly larger than the image sensors you're gonna find in a phone. A bigger sensor means being able to soak up more light and at the same time deliver better dynamic range and better clarity. And when we're going through a testing protocol like this, terminology can sometimes cloud the waters, especially for illustrating a particular concept, something like aperture, for example. The lens that I'm shooting on is an aperture of f1.7, while Huawei boasts an f1.6 aperture on the Mate 10 Pro. That difference in sensor size, though, has a radical difference in the output for your photos. Images from the Mate 10 Pro with this f1.6 aperture are going to look very similar to images from the Panasonic at f8 to f10. That's a humongous difference in performance. In the past for phones, that was an automatic deal breaker for any kind of natural bokeh. You could only really achieve a pleasant depth of field when working pretty close, near macro distances from a phone. But that's where software algorithms are now going to bridge some of the gap between smartphone cameras and proper standalone cameras. To grossly oversimplify, the two camera sensors on this phone detect what you focused on. It's gonna try and detect what the subject of your photo is, cut it out just like you would in Photoshop, remove the subject from the image, blur out the background, then replace the subject, and maybe they'll feather the edges, the border that they used to trim just to help blend the subject back into the background of your photo. And many phones now will allow you to adjust the amount of blur. One of the things that I really like about Huawei system, that slider, they do try to approximate what the aperture might be on a proper camera. For all of these comparison shots between the Mate 10 Pro and the Panasonic G85, I'm pretty much letting the cameras decide the exposure. Huawei's wide aperture mode is pretty much an auto mode. You don't have a lot of control for changing exposure settings like your shutter speed or your ISO. So I'm letting the G85 pretty much dictate the same. I'm locking it to aperture priority so I can control the aperture and make it consistent. But then ISO, shutter speed, I'm letting the camera decide what it thinks a good image should resemble. In a variety of shots moving back and forth between the two platforms, the phone does a pretty good job of hanging in there for the final finished JPEG at medium distances from your subject, where we would best create a head and shoulders portrait of a human being. And if we have really good light, the phone effect is stunning. The standalone camera still wins for the more photographic elements, the more natural fall off of focus from your subject, a better dynamic range, better clarity and detail. But to the untrained eye, you're just generally scanning through your social media feed, the finished JPEGs being shared on those kinds of platforms. 
they're all gonna look pretty good online. When in good light, the major challenge for the phone comes from texture meeting busy background. You know, the edges of my flat cap running up to the out of focus chain link fence behind me. Algorithms have to make a choice about where to cut for the subject and they won't always get it right. Looking at closer shots, approaching the minimum focusing distance from each lens, Huawei's software, again, gets us really close to the kind of output we expect from a standalone camera, but it can't quite replicate that razor thin plane of focus that the G85 can create. And I purposely started with photos in good light to show the strengths of this camera platform, where it's going to perform the best. Things start to unravel for the phone camera once we start changing up the conditions of these shots. Moving just a little further from your subject compounds some of the limitations of what this software can really do. You actually can produce more blur from the software processing at this distance than what the lens can naturally produce, but there's also way more opportunities for the software to improperly recognize the border and boundary of your subject. Also adding more people to your shot, framing for two people at this distance with a busy background, we're riding just outside the preferred distance for utilizing this effect correctly. Again, Huawei can produce more blur than the standalone camera, but there's also significantly more cutting errors. And it's not just having that busy background, the phone recovers phenomenally well as soon as it can prioritize one person over the other. But the single biggest factor in photo quality is light. The better the light, the better the image you can capture. Moving indoors, the Mate can still deliver if you have a little patience. You have to hold a little steadier and I can get a decently crisp shot where I had no issues at all from the G85. Held down the shutter button for just a second, got a quick burst of photos, I was good to go. Moving just a little bit darker, we should celebrate the photo processing in image conditions like this. Super dark background and one spot of light right on my face. A ton of post-processing, noise reduction, but JPEG to JPEG? I actually think Huawei delivers the nicer, easier image to share right from the camera. Of course, the Panasonic has the higher quality image and I'm able to pull more detail out of the shadows of the shot from the G85 but that requires you know, some time spent editing. It's not as critical a victory for the standalone camera if your preferred method of sharing photos is a setup like Instagram. Your final image is gonna get wrecked anyway, compressed to hell. So why not use the easier photo to share, the one that requires less editing? However, that story completely flips once we remove the light source from my face, once conditions just get that little bit darker. Intense noise reduction, final output that's dull, that's blurry, that's soft around the edges, looks super splotchy. It's worth reiterating, compared to iPhones and the Note 8, this is actually pretty stellar performance that this effect can still be utilized even under these conditions. Apple simply won't let you produce any output in portrait mode at night in the dark like this. Even while calling this a victory for the Huawei though, flipping back over to the Panasonic, it effortlessly crushes what the phone is capable of producing. And I still had plenty of room to spare in jacking up the ISO or using a longer shutter speed. Okay, I've rambled on enough, it's time to wrap this up. Where's that leave us between the smartphone using some kind of wide aperture camera portrait mode software background blur and a proper specialist solution in interchangeable lens camera system. Well, yeah, cameras still win, that's pretty easy. But for consumers, the gap between phones and proper cameras has narrowed significantly. I posted two shots on Instagram, a quick comparison, just stapled them right together, and it wasn't any great surprise that most people who looked at that photo were able to properly identify which photo came from a phone and which photo came from my Panasonic. But that's the trick, isn't it? The better photo is immediately, easily identifiable when juxtaposed against a poor quality output. If they're viewed on their own, software processing under good conditions easily delivers what it's intended to do. Draw the viewer's eye to what you want them to see and minimize any distracting elements around your subject. Flipping through a social media feed of images, scanning through your Instagram or your Facebook feed, I think the average photo consumer 
would be hard-pressed to identify the source of an image, properly point to what tool was used to capture that shot. Standalone cameras still crush. The enthusiast market is really well served, especially moving up the food chain from where I'm shooting on micro for thirds, going up to APS-C or full frame cameras with incredible capabilities. But like I said before, the smartphone is ubiquitous. Understanding its limitations, understanding the compromises this camera brings to the table, you can drive this thing. You can get remarkably close to the output from a specialist tool. Now that's not too shabby. As always, folks, thank you so much for watching. Putting together a video like this takes a significant amount of time and energy, which unfortunately, YouTube monetization in its current state can't quite support. If you'd like to see more content like this, more showdowns, comparisons, in-depth analysis, please consider checking out my Patreon campaign. You'll get early access to videos, weekly AMA and Discord chat, I'll be hosting contests, and uh, even a copy of my book, Take Better Photos, Smartphone Photography for Noobs. I'm really hoping to build a cool community over there, so your participation is greatly appreciated. Folks, you know where you can find me around the web, at some gadget guy. I will catch you on the next video.